Those animals that we tested, take it from the locations we got them, they don't have the disease. It's very possible that we would find that out by testing other canines. It's just as possible, and this is what the research is directed at determining, that the opposite is true. But if the disease that we were able to assess, that the canines have dropped the eggs in your summer grazing area, in your riparian areas, in your watersheds, chances are those eggs that can live from hours to years depending on the environment, environmental conditions. And believe it or not, the range of what these eggs can live is from about 100, minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit to about 176 degrees Fahrenheit. They can survive in temperatures of that. However, other environmental conditions will affect them also. Very arid areas, direct sunlight, ground is hot, they don't survive well on asphalt in the summertime. Okay? So there's other things that are involved here when we talk about how long that would happen. But the longer the disease is out there in the terrain, the more likely it is to establish concentrations and saturations. Saturations mean what goes into the soil. Now, this, they, they, recently, we've discovered a test for soil samples that you can do to see whether or not, uh, in a specific area, you have eggs in the soil. There are four principal ways of determining by medical tests whether you've got it or not. One of them requires the canine to be dead. Okay. It's called the gold standard. And what you do is you take out of the canine, the small intestine, open it up, wash it down, and you count the, the eggs. Excuse me, you count the worms. Now, I don't know if you folks know how big these worms are, you don't. Two to seven millimeters. You take a standard scale from your sixth grade student, and you look at the scale, it's got a centimeter scale on there. One line, one centimeter, is not even as, 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 as longer than the longest of these worms are. So what happened in this study is they determined that not only did you have 62% of the wolves that they looked at in this sample with worms, but a high percentage of them had more than 1,000 in their intestines. In between that, they looked and they find a significant percentage that had between 100 and a thousand worms. They also determined that most, a good percentage of this sample was about two to three years old. You know, as we get older, we get in weight. As you get older, as a canine, you eat more ungulates, more elk, more deer, uh, whitetail, mule deer, moose, sheep, cattle, whatever. So you, you ingest more of the intermediate phase called hydatid cysts that have the tapeworm heads, it looks like a little polywog, in it. And so when the wolf or the canine as a predator, you know, and your, your uh, golden retriever can be a predator at times, and you may not know it, but that can happen. Your lab, my Brittany can. And how does that happen? That happens because sometimes the elk, the deer, are roadkill. I think we've all seen, yeah, well, there's one just broke its neck, there's one that broke its back, and God, that was all over the road. The dog gets into that, that's infected, he becomes a predator on that, and he gets it. And he brings it home to you. So free-roaming dogs are an issue. Okay? And it's there. Now, the other side of that was the, the rest of it was 100 or less worms. Now, we did a study that evaluated what did that mean? How many eggs per day, based on this distribution of over a thousand, up to a thousand, under a hundred, how many eggs did that mean an infected wolf, on the average, out of this sample, would drop daily in the terrain? Well, the assumption was they only took a, a crap once a day. If they did that, you got 1,042 eggs on the average out of each infected wolf on the terrain. If, as most people say, they're well fed, they probably took four craps a day, it's four times that. 
So we know that it's out there somewhere. We just don't know what the effect is. And that's what we're looking for. And the only way that we can work with, uh, with the study is to work with you folks and to have you understand what we're doing. Kind of checks and balances. If you oversee what's doing, and, uh, what we're doing, and participating, we maintain a chain of custody of what we're doing. The transparency is there. Now we can do it on our own, but we certainly would, would like anybody who would like to work with us to, to work with us on this. Here's a bit of information for your ranchers. I see a hand on how many people are ranchers here. Australia, Queensland, 1987, 2004, that period of time. Cattle, taken to the slaughterhouse. 33,000 or more, that's a rough, rough, rough number, cattle wound up because they are an ungulate. They eat the eggs when they're grazing. They picked up the egg and they ingested it. 33,000 had hydatid cysts. The intermediate phase of the take one's life cycle. Primary phase would be with the wool for the eggs. Okay? And that's how we're describing it. Right. Now, what did that mean? Well, what it meant in 1987 is they lost $500,000 in the internal organ market. Cat food, dog food, I guess that's what it means. I'm not sure. Last time I was ranching was with my parents. I was three years old. I wasn't good enough, so they threw me off the ranch. But in any event, on the other side of it, 2004, out of that same area, they lost $6 million. Not in the meat. Out of the organ market. Happens. So we're not only talking about from the standpoint of uh, human issues that we have to find out, we have to put to bed, or we have to find the reality of what we're faced with. We're also talking about the impact on other uh, economic areas of our uh, counties and state. And we're hoping by addressing it this way, we'll be able to uh, move on to other things. Now, you received some handouts that, that earlier on. That came from the. Uh, Western Predator Control Association. Um, I'm not the author. I wouldn't get it anyway. Um, but those handouts came from questions, the questionnaires that we have passed out to the folks that have attended some of our other presentations. And so that is an answer to some of the questions that were asked. Again, there's a disclaimer on there. I'm not a lawyer. Wouldn't admit it right now if I was. And so it's a fair information. There's another hand out there that talks about how you should handle when you're hunting, how you should handle uh, the wolf in particular when you're out there hunting. Now we have other educational presentations we make and we're hoping to be able to do some presentations uh, out there in the fall so that our hunters, our guides, our outfitters, and anybody else that happens to be hiking in the woods will have a better idea of what they're to avoid, so to speak, where to look. What watershed? How many people know what sheet flow means? What sheet flow? Okay, sheet flow is when you, for example, your terrain is covered by snow and it begins to melt. It melts uniformly across an area. The water flows like a sheet. Rain does the same thing across terrain. It goes sheet flow from open terrain down into draws, draws into through creek beds, into stream beds, into rivers. That sheet flow, if you've got a significant amount of eggs in the area where it's occurring, they'll wash down into your water. Probably more important, when I first discovered this to me, because I hunt, I used to go out and hey, I didn't even take the water with me, there's plenty of it out there. I don't do that anymore. I take my own water with me. And if I don't have water, I don't have water until I get back. The reason is, is because one of the ways to transmit this disease to the people is by ingesting it through drinking water that has eggs in it. So we're looking around our riparian areas, around our streams, is one of the areas we will look at at first. We're going to look at areas in collecting the data 
where it has a more direct relationship to you and I being exposed to it. When we're collecting samples, we're really talking about collecting scat. We have a collection kit. We can also collect serum, blood samples. And anybody who wishes to participate with us will teach you how to do this and how to avoid becoming infected so that the samples that we can collect will be on a broader base. This is obviously a labor-intensive effort. Okay? Yes, sir? I just had a quick question. So the eggs and the disease, are they just as much in the elk and the deer and the sheep? And oh, let me address the, the life cycle. It starts with the canine. The canine has a tapeworm in its small intestine. The tapeworm in the intestine excretes eggs. It can excrete eggs individually or in pods. They go out and through and is deposited on the, on the terrain in the scat. The scat sits there. It cures, it's hit by rain. In any event, the egg become free. The eggs are then transported. They can be transported by many vectors. Wind, rain, snow melt, people, vehicles. If you, if you get a hold of uh, George Double, and George and I have some conversation over the phone on some of this. In fact, I'm going to have to talk to him about plagiarism. I just have to do that. Uh, it describes, it is probably the most comprehensive, straightforward writing on the whole situation. Get it and read it. It'll give you a great picture of what we're faced with. In any event, back to your question. It goes from the egg to the grazing animal. The grazing animal picks it up in the grass. It ingests it. If the egg goes in, and then the egg shell, and by the way, uh, I'll, I'll get back to this point in a moment. The egg shell then, as it's being digested, fades away, and, they, and the, the element that's left is called an iconosphere goes into the intestines of the animal. That element, called the iconosphere, penetrates the intestine wall. It gets into the bloodstream. It finds a vital organ so it can grow into a cyst. It binds the lungs, it binds the kidney, it finds the liver. And in children, studied 123 medical reports, medical cases, worldwide, age group was children, infants to adults. But I took a look at the infant and young adults, two years old to 16 years old. These cases, every one of those cases, had a, a high data cyst in the brain. Okay. So it's a serious issue, but it's only a serious issue if you get exposed, contact, contract, you know, by ingesting, okay. and then it grows inside your system. So anyway, we get back to that. So then that develops into a cyst. The canine kills the animal, eats the organs, eats the cysts, and these little polywogs that I mentioned earlier, it's basically called hydatic sand. It's a tapeworm head. They ingest into their system. That goes through the digestive tract and develops into a tapeworm in their intestine. And the cycle continues. If you break that cycle, I mean, if you really can break that cycle, you don't have a problem because the cycle creates the tapeworms. No cycle, no tapeworms. Tasmania, I don't know how many people know what Tasmania is besides the Tasmania devil. Okay. <laughs> it's down here in Australia, okay? It's right off, the, it's a small island off the, the coast of Australia. It took them 40 years to eradicate the disease down there. In 1996, they declared their island disease free. Key note is their island. Last time I knew, there weren't too many woods or coyotes or dingoes swimming from Australia and New Zealand to Tasmania. So once they cured it and they handled the canine issue, they handled the lung issue, they cured it. They didn't have it anymore. I hope I don't have a test on this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everything you said, but I, I, I guess help you. Okay, but first of all, I'm